بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد اللهم صل على وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيد ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب اللهم صل على الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربى The first of our salawat in honor of رسول الله محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم اللهم صل على محمد The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa al-Zaman. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Imam Al-Hasan bin Ali salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi was born on the 15th of Ramadan in the third year after Hijrah and died in the month of Safar in the 50th year after Hijrah. A man from whose life many a lesson may be learnt and many an example may be derived and a man whose life has to be examined in depth, for his life affects each and every one of our lives today. Unfortunately, however, he continues to be a man whose depiction is extremely negative, both in Muslim as well as in non-Muslim circles. Arguably, the most misunderstood of the Imams of Al Muhammad is this Imam. In the idea that until today, he is not given the credit that he deserves for the amount of sacrifices, bravery, and acts of wisdom that he performed in his life. Until today, many question the bravery of Imam al Hassan, many question the wisdom of his decisions, many question his lifestyle. And you find that in the academic world, as well as within the Muslim world, there are many who portray him in a very negative tone. If you look, for example, in the academic world, you'll find that many books which discuss the life of Imam al-Hassan discuss him in a very negative tone. Will Freshora, for example, in his book on the Agha Khans, speaks of Imam al-Hassan as a man who all he did in his life was marry and divorce. Marry and divorce. They used to call him the habitual divorcee because they used to say all he used to enjoy was marrying women than divorcing them. You find likewise this is echoed by Reverend Henri Lamon. And further than this, Amir Ali in his book, The Spirit of Islam, talks about how Imam al Hassan was a man who was fond of the easy and quiet life. He was not interested in the religion of Islam. All he was interested in was being with woman and divorcing woman. This negative portrayal of Imam al Hassan is a portrayal which exists until today. At the same time, you find that Imam al Hassan, one of the other negative depictions about him was that they placed Imam Hassan alongside personalities who did not build the religion of Islam, rather sought to destroy the religion of Islam. Until today, people always say, and you will find recently a documentary or a series has been made 
where people talk about Imam al-Hassan and Muawiyah as the great restorers of the religion of Islam. The two of them brought unity to the religion. And it really is sad that Imam al-Hassan is compared with personalities whose only aim was to come and build a power base in a kingdom, not a caliphate in the religion of Islam. Therefore, you find that one of the accusations that exist until today about Imam al-Hassan was that he sold his khalafa for 7 million dirhams. There's a book which discusses Imam al-Hassan, which says that Imam al-Hassan sold his caliphate for 7 million dirhams. He sold it for 7 million, gave five, 2 million to Imam al Hussein. He kept 5 million for himself and allowed Muawiyah to continue ruling. All of these accusations have to be replied back to. And do not be surprised, Imam al Hassan's grandfather is accused of similar things until today. That the Holy Prophet, until today, people say, was a man of woman and nothing more. The Holy Prophet, until today, people say, was a man who signed treaties more than showed bravery. And therefore you find that there are many similarities when you analyze the biography of Imam al Hassan with his grandfather, the Holy Prophet. Let's examine his life and see what are the myths that were created about Imam al Hassan and how do we reply back to these myths. Because in our communities, unfortunately, many of us know more about Imam al Hussein than about Imam al Hassan. Some will say, why is that unfortunate? Because Imam al Hussein himself used to look up to Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. Further than this, some of us believe Imam al Hussein was braver than Imam al Hassan. You will find some people in the community will say, Imam al Hassan was a weak man, whereas Imam al Hussein was a brave man. What they do not realize is, if you swap their positions, they would have acted in exactly the same way. Let's examine this and dissect his biography in depth. As we said, the Imam was born on the 15th of Ramadan in the third year after Hijrah. His parents were married the year before. And therefore you found that he was the first child in the household of the family of the Prophet. As you know, being the first child, this brought delight. It brought delight to the household of the Prophet. In which way? In the idea that Rasul Allah's first grandson was Imam al Hassan. And if you look at the reaction of Rasul Allah when he hears that Imam al Hassan was born, the reaction is a wonderful reaction. With Imam al Hussein, there was more sadness when he was born. Rasul Allah, the hadiths tell us when Imam al Hussein was born, his steps were very heavy when he walked to the house of Fatima al Zahra. But with Imam al Hassan, he was overjoyed. He came to the house and there was straight away a connection between himself and Imam al-Hassan. And you find that the narrations tell us that Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen is asked, what are you going to name this boy? Imam replies with something which is interesting, which not many people pay attention to. Imam Ali replies, the naming of my son is with Rasul Allah, not with me. When Rasul Allah is then asked, what are you going to name your grandson? He replies, the naming of my grandson is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this point is a delicate point. Normally people gloss over it. Why is it a delicate point? When a name is to be given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's an indication that this person, wherever he goes in his life, is being guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, isn't it? As in now, if I say that there is a rightly guided Khalifa, many of the rightly guided Caliphs, their names were given to them by Mushrik fathers, isn't that true? As in many of the Caliphs who we say are rightly guided, their fathers were Mushrik, they were polytheists, and they named them, and at the end we said they are rightly guided. How can we reach a conclusion? That if someone whose father is mushrik and names him, at the end of the day, this person is rightly guided. But the one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala names, we are not sure whether to call him rightly guided. Because today in the world, when you ask people, how many rightly guided khulafa are there? They say to you, number one, number two, number three, number four. You say, how about Imam al-Hassan? They say, we are not sure about Imam al-Hassan. 
Him and Muawiyah are on the same level, but we are not sure which one of them is right. The reply that we give is, Imam al-Hasan when Rasulullah says, I await Jibra'il's command before I name him. Isn't this an indication that Imam al-Hasan is always guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So then Rasulullah tells the family, Jibra'il has just come to me and said to me, name him al-Hasan. Al-Hasan was a name never given to anyone before him. There was a mountain in Arabia, there was a mountain called the Hassan Mountain. But there was never a human being by the name of Hassan. Therefore you found the first to be given this name was Imam Al-Hassan. And I tell you this name, Hassan and Hussein, later on in Islamic history, people would pride themselves on sacrificing anyone with this name. People would come and kill anyone who had the name Hassan. One person narrates, I went to Sham, I went to see one of my friends, one of my cousins. I entered the house, I had noticed in Sham, no one is called Hassan, no one's called Hussein. I was disappointed. I entered my friend's house, as soon as I entered, he called his son, said, Hassan, Hussein, come here. I said to him, Masha Allah, you have named your sons Hassan and Hussein after the grandsons of Rasul Allah. He said to me, what do you mean, Masha Allah? He said, it's an honor that you've named your sons after this. He said, no, I named them this so that when I get angry, I send my curse on Hassan and my curse on Hussein. It's reached that level that these names of the flowers of the life of Rasul Allah reached the level where people were embarrassed to give these names. Embarrassed. You find therefore that Rasulullah names him and there is no relationship like Imam Al-Hasan and Imam Al-Hussein with Rasulullah to the extent that Rasulullah uses them as an intermediary for giving children their rights in the religion. Because you know the Arabs, the Arabs used to be embarrassed of showing affection to their kids. To an Arab, if you hug your child or if you kiss your child, it wasn't a sign of a masculine man in front of you. No. You were able to be proud of your children. Yes, they are a zina in your life. But for you to kiss them, this was unheard of. Rasulullah with Imam al Hassan would perform many acts, not only out of his love for Imam al Hassan, but so that others would see him and take as an example. For example, Whenever he'd walk past the house of his daughter, he'd stop near the house and he'd say, O oh family of the Prophet, where is the flower of my heart, Al Hassan? Imam Al Hassan would run out of the house. Rasulullah would hug him in front of all his companions and he would say, I love him and Allah loves the one who loves him. You would find on another occasion that Rasulullah would even. Let Imam al Hassan sit on his shoulders and he'd walk around. You know, sometimes they call it piggy bank. You put that child on your shoulder and he would walk around with the child. You would find that the companions would come. They would see Rasulullah doing this. You know what they'd say to Imam al Hassan? Not to Rasulullah. They'd say to the young Imam al Hassan, Oh son, how blessed you are with the steed that you are riding. Rasulullah would reply, No. How blessed I am with the rider. This was an indication. All of these are indications. You're telling the boy how blessed he is on my shoulder. On the contrary, how blessed I am with the rider. That I'm honored that this boy rides on my shoulder. On top of this, you would find Rasulullah, if he was in his sujood, in his prostration, he would lengthen it for Imam al Hassan to be on the back. And you would find Rasulullah telling the people that this is the master of the youth of paradise. This is the flower of my life. One day, one of the Arabs by the name of Al Agra. Al Agra means the bold headed one. May Allah bless the mother who is so creative with that name. Al Agra called the bold headed one. Al Agra on one occasion comes to Rasulullah and said, Ya Rasulullah, I saw you kiss Imam Al Hassan today. He said, yes. He said, I've got 10 sons. I've never kissed any of them. He said, why? He said, Ya Rasulullah, they are my sons. What am I doing kissing them? I want them to be men. Rasulullah would reply with a beautiful answer. 
He'd say, whoever doesn't have mercy on his children will not receive mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have mercy towards these children. Hassan and Hussein, I show them mercy so you follow this example. Therefore, the first influence on the life of Imam Hassan was Rasulullah. The second influence was the spirituality of his mother Fatima. I tell you, people do not realize how much of a relation Imam Hassan had with his mother Fatima. Do you know every lesson Imam Al Hassan had in his life? The origin of the lesson was his mother Fatima, and that's why Imam Al Askari, sallallahu wa sallamu Imam Al Askari has a phenomenal line. Imam Al Askari says, "We, the Imams, are a hujja over the people, and Fatima is a hujja over us. We." Are a hujja, are a proof on the people. But our grandmother Fatima is a proof over us. In which way? Imam al Hassan would show us a mother with spirituality can build a household. Napoleon used to say, Give me good mothers, I'll give you a strong nation. Imam al Hassan on many occasions would talk about the lessons he learned from his mother. And that's why, do you know, no Imam of Ahlul Bayt had spirituality like Imam al Hassan when it came to Hajj. Imam al Hassan, 25 occasions he walked to Hajj by foot. Today, if the flight is late, you always have that one naggy person in the group, isn't it? The headache, I call him. Or some call him the virus. You find that there's always one person in the group who gives you a headache because of a flight being late. Habibi, why are you coming with us Hajj then? Stay at home, go on holiday somewhere else. The Hajj was meant to be a struggle. You find that Imam al Hassan learned this spirituality, this love for worship from his mother. In which way? He narrates in the middle of the night, I was only a child. I'd wake up, I'd see my mother Fatima al Zahra reciting Salat al Layl. In the middle of the night, I'd go and sit next to her while she's supplicating. While she's supplicating, I'd go and sit next to her. And while I'd be next to her, I'd want to listen to her dua, her supplication. And I'd hear her supplication saying, Ya Allah, forgive the members of the community and then forgive us. Ya Allah, bless the members of the community and bless us. Ya Allah, be generous to the members of the community and be generous to us. He'd say, Mother, in the middle of the night, I see you praying for everybody else. How about for your household? She replied to him with an exquisite line. Oh my son Hassan, first the neighbors, then the house. One of the conditions of dua being accepted, which many of us don't understand, is that first we have to ask for our friends, then ourselves. Many of us are very selfish. Straight away, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want... Okay, how about the other community members? One day a person came to Rasulullah on this issue. He said, Ya Rasulullah, my dua is not being accepted. Rasulullah said to him, do you pray for others first, then yourself? He said, no. He said, very well, pray for others, then for yourself. So the person prayed in front of Rasulullah, he said, Ya Allah, bless me, bless Muhammad, and don't bless anyone else. He said, no, 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 no. You don't need to be the dua like that. I mean that you pray for everybody and for yourself. That have this lack of, remove this selfishness from you. Imam al Hassan would say in the middle of the night, the world is asleep. My mother Fatima, I would see her read dua, supplicate to others. He'd say, then my mother Fatima, what would I see? He'd say in the daytime, I'd see my mother Fatima answering the questions of religion for the woman of Arabia. This is a mother. This is a mother. There is a spirituality and a service for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today you find some of the mothers, there is a lack of a spirituality sometimes. There's more concern with the image of the child, the schooling of the child, the degree of the child, so I can show off to the community. Fatima al-Zahra said, these things are good. Having degree, having education, no problem. But where's the spirituality where you as a role model for your daughter or your son? Fatima al-Zahra, a lady would come, Imam al-Hassan would say, Ladies would come to my mother's house. My mother's cooking. My mother's cleaning. My mother's looking after all of us. Yet a lady would come and say to her, Oh my dear lady Fatima, my mother is ill. I have come to ask her questions on her behalf 
I want you to answer them. Fatima al-Zahra would say, what are the questions? The reply would be, they are questions concerning salah. Fatima al-Zahra would tell her, go ahead, ask. That lady would ask and ask and ask and ask until at the end she said to Fatima al-Zahra, oh lady of light, I may have troubled you too much with my questions, forgive me. Maybe it's better that I don't ask anymore. Listen to Fatima al-Zahra's reply according to Imam al-Hasan. Imam al-Hasan is so young at this time. You know, Imam al-Hasan was eight years of age when his mother died. All of this that I'm telling you, he saw from a young age. He said, my mother looked at her and said, if a person was asked to carry something from the ground to the roof of a building for a thousand dinar, would they say they are tired? The lady said, no. She said, I, when I answer your questions, Allah has promised the reward of pearls between the heavens and the earth. Why would I be tired when it's a service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That generosity from Fatima al-Zahra he saw, and then another influence on his young days was his father, Amir al muminin His father had a major impact on him. Do you know why? Because his father, Imam, would see the sacrifices his father and mother would make as a couple. Remember, a child looks at the relationship of their parents. Is it healthy? Is it softly spoken? Are there arguments and shouting at home constantly? Many a child psychologically is damaged when they see their parents fighting all the time at home. Sometimes as parents, there is a role to play where if I have a difference with my wife, why do I take it out in front of the whole of the children of the house? Can't me and my wife sit somewhere else in the house and talk? In Muslim communities today, if I have a problem with my wife, I'll bring her down in front of her children. Ahl al-Bayt never taught us like this. Ahl al-Bayt taught us even if there's a difference of opinion, there's another room you can go to. Talk between yourselves. Fighting in front of your children, that child psychologically is damaged. That child psychologically is hurt. She would say, I would see my mother and my father in unison with each other. The most beautiful combination of a marriage. And subhanallah, he would say that night when me and Hassan and Hussein were ill. And my parents were worried about us. And they asked Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, what is it that we should do? Hassan and Hussein are ill. He said, fast, make a vow that if they get better, you will fast for three nights. He said the first night, I saw that as we were about to break our fast, someone knocked at our door. He said, I saw my mother and my father speak to each other. And they said, whoever it is, whatever they need, we will give them. Imagine you're about to break your iftar. Imagine now tonight in Shah Ramadan, you're about to break your iftar. Someone knocks at the door, say, do you mind giving me something? You'll say, listen, Habibi, I've been fasting for 12 hours. Leave this house. Or oh, if we if he's lucky, what will we do? We might give him a loaf of something, some small piece of meat, and we might let them go. He said, I saw my father and my mother. When the person answered the door, oh family of the prophets, we are ill. We are prisoner, an orphan, a captive. On each of the nights, I saw them go to sleep without any food. This family, I tell you, this family, their sacrifice cannot be counted. You can't count the sacrifice. If it's in terms of food, if it's in terms of wealth, if it's in terms of their own life, you can't count it. And he said that was when the verse, وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا They would give towards the prisoner and the orphan and the captive. And what did they want? They didn't want jaza, they didn't want shukur, they didn't want the community to thank them. Rather, it was from their hearts. He saw their sacrifices. And that's why Imam al-Hassan's first grand occasion at a young age was when his grandfather Rasulullah took him on the occasion of Mubahala. When he went to meet the Christians of Najran, these Christians were amazed. Do you know why they were amazed? Imam al-Hassan was six years old. Imam al Hussein was five years old. They could not believe that Rasulullah had bought a six and a five year old on an event where Allah was going to send down a curse on the disbelievers. But you know what was so beautiful about that event? Rasulullah was telling the Muslims, it was a year and a half before he died. Mubahala was one and a half years before Rasulullah died. And exactly one year before the day of Ghadir, 
When Rasulullah went to the event of Mubahala, many companions thought he'd take them with him. When Rasulullah took his family, do you know what he was saying? He was saying, when it comes to sacrificing for this religion, on a day like Mubahala or any day after Mubahala, these are the five all of you have to look up to. It was an indication that after I die, when the Quran says, فَمَنْ حَاجَكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْا نَدْعُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ The Quran, Allah tells him, take your sons. He takes Hassan and Hussein with him as his sons. And therefore, when you look at Imam Al-Hassan, those first eight years were eight years of glory. All of a sudden, then the trials of life begin to hit. His grandfather Rasulullah dies. And when his grandfather Rasulullah dies, the narration says to us that when his grandfather Rasulullah dies on his deathbed, his grandfather is narrated to have said when Imam Ali came to remove Imam Al Hassan, his grandfather said, No, 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 let me smell more of him and let him smell more of me. Then, only a few months later, Imam Al Hassan sees his mother Fatima al Zahra killed in front of him. Eight years of age. So, why can't these children sit down? Only Allah knows. Eight years of age, you find Imam Al Hassan sees his grandmother Fatima, his mother Fatima al Zahra killed in front of him, and he becomes really the father of the house. He becomes the father of the house. That he's got a younger brother Hussein. And he's got a younger sister Zainab. And he's got another younger sister Kulthum. And Imam al Hassan saw certain things with his mother I don't want to mention from the Mimbar. Imam al Hassan saw the way his mother was treated. And it stayed with him for years. You see your mother hit the way she was hit. That stays with you. When your mother dies angry with certain personalities who come outside her house, every book of hadith says that when she said, This is the house of the daughter of Rasulullah. And the reply was, so what? So what? We'll come and burn the house. Read, read the books of hadith. Who was Fatima angry with when she died? Yet the responsibility therefore came for Imam al Hassan to act as a father figure for his brother and his younger sisters. And that's why I'll tell you something. One of the biggest myths created about Imam al Hassan, which I always hear, and I tell you it's a great myth. The people say Imam al Hassan was not as strong as Imam al Hussein. He didn't have Imam al Hussein's bravery. Imam al Hussein was very brave. We saw it at Karbala. They say Imam al Hassan had no bravery. Imam al Hassan was someone who was fond of the easy life. Imam al Hassan was someone who enjoyed staying away from the battlefield. Do you know at Jamal and Safin there was no one as important as Imam al Hassan on the battlefield? At Jamal and Safin, there was no one as important as Imam al Hassan on the battlefield. I ask all of you, as followers of Imam al Hassan, how many of us have read about Imam al Hassan in Jamal? How many of us have read about Imam al Hassan at Safin? How many of us? Do you know before the Battle of Jamal, do you know who it was who made people come and fight with Imam Ali alongside Imam Ali? Imam al Hassan gave a khutbah before the Battle of Jamal. I tell you, this was one of the most powerful lectures ever given in Islamic history. Imam al Hassan, Abu Musa al Ash'ari, when he was in Kufa, was telling people, don't go and fight with Ali ibn Abi Talib, stay in Kufa. Imam al Hassan turned around and his father said, Hassan, go with Ammar ibn Yasir, go and give a speech to them and tell them who I am. I tell you, when you read that speech, you should go away and read the speech of Imam al-Hassan. He gave a speech where he told the people of Kufa, have you forgotten the day of Ghadir when my father was chosen? Did you forget what my father gave the religion of Islam when he was younger? At Badr and at Uhud and at Khandaq and at Khaybar and Hunayn. And now people come out to find my father and you are sitting here? He rallied the troops on the day of Jamal. All of them came. On the front line on the day of Jamal, Hassan ibn Ali, Malik al Ashtar, Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr, Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya, all of them were standing on the front line on the day of Jamal. Imam Amir al Mu'mineen tells Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya, his son, 
from another wife, from Khawla bin Ja'far, Imam says to Muhammad, Oh Muhammad, you see those soldiers, even if their arrows are coming towards you, remain firm like the mountains. Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya was a valiant warrior. He came out, he came back surely to his dad. He said, Dad, I can't continue. He said to him, why? He said, because the arrows are sharp and they are showering on us. His father looked at him and he said, that is the difference between all sons and the sons of Fatima al-Zahra. He said to him, why? He said, look at my son Hassan. If I let him out on that battle, he will annihilate their army. When Imam Ali says annihilate an army, Imam Ali knows a soldier. Imam al Hassan, if he went out in the battle of Jamal by himself, Imam Ali was confident Imam al Hassan would have annihilated them by himself. But Imam, al Imam Ali kept calling him back. And when he'd say, Father, what is it? He kept on telling him, Hassan, stay back. You are the Imam after me. Stay back. I don't want you to be in the middle because I know you in the middle. I know how brave you are. None will come near you, but stay back. And then even at Safin, even at Safin, Imam al Hassan at Safin had a fantastic effect on the battle to the extent Abaydullah ibn Umar ibn al Khattab, Abaydullah tried to bribe Imam al Hassan at Safin. Abaydullah at Safin comes to Imam al Hassan on behalf of Muawiyah. He says to him, Al Hassan, knowing how brave Imam al Hassan is, they used to say at Safin, if you can break Imam Ali, Imam al Hassan, and Malik al Ashtar, you can win. He came to Imam al Hassan at Safin. He said, Hassan, listen, your father, the Arabs hate him because when he was younger, he killed many of their fathers. Take this envelope and join our side. We will look after you in a way no one will. Wallah, Imam al Hassan looked at him and he said, A man like me joins a man like you. And a man like me leaves a father like my father. He said, you'll die shortly. And subhanAllah, it was only shortly after that that Ubaidullah ibn Umar died. At Safin, when Imam Ali, when Sulaiman al khuzai came to Imam Ali, at Safin. And Imam Ali looked at him and he said, Sulaiman, I expected you to be loyal to us. But I don't see any loyalty. Sulaiman said, Imam, forgive me, I am here now. Imam said, but I thought you'll be alongside me. Sulaiman went to Imam al Hassan al Safin. He said, Hassan, look at the way your dad talks to me. Why is your dad so angry with me? And Imam al Hassan would say, When my dad loves someone, he's disappointed when he doesn't see his loyalty. Calm down, do not be angry. He had that calming influence in the battle of Safin that people would look up to him when the times got tough. They'd see Hassan ibn Ali standing there. They'd go and they'd stand alongside him. And that's why when Safin finished, Imam was disappointed. Why? Because Imam al Hassan looked at the people at Safin, Ali on one side, Muawiyah on the other, the man who sacrificed everything for the religion. They leave him and they join the man whose father virtually wanted to destroy the religion. And that's why at the arbitration at Safin, Imam looked at Abu Musa al Ash'ari and looked at the people and he said clearly to the people, he said, Abu Musa al Ash'ari, you choose him. If Umar ibn al Khattab thought Abu Musa al Ash'ari is good, he would have put him in the Shura. Not only this, he said, and Abu Musa wants to choose Abdullah bin Umar. If Abdullah bin Umar was worthy, then his father would have elected him. Then he said, and as for you, Khawarij, who have left the army of my father, because you know Nahrawan was after Safin, the Khawarij were from the army of Imam Ali, they fought him. He said, as for you who say there shouldn't be arbitration, you don't just be brave with your sword. Sometimes you have to be brave with your tongue as well. He looked at them and he said, as for you who say there shouldn't be an arbitration, did Rasulullah not use Sa'ad bin Mu'ad in his arbitration with Banu Qurayza? Then why are you talking about no arbitration when Sa'ad bin Mu'ad was used for Banu Qurayza by the Prophet? These people, unfortunately, left the side of his father. And that's why in the 40th year after Hijrah, Imam al Hassan sees his father killed in the mosque of Kufa by Abdul Rahman ibn Muljam. And I tell you, Imam al Hassan was deeply affected by his father's death for a number of reasons. The first reason was that natural sentimental value a son has with a father. And can you have a father like Ali ibn Abi Talib? Honestly. 
Can a human have a father like Amir al-Mu'mineen? It's impossible that anyone can come near Ali ibn Abi Talib in terms of his warmth, in terms of his generosity, in terms of his justice. None could come near the son of Abu Talib. And remember, Imam Ali brought up Imam al-Hassan and Hussein and Zain ibn Kulthum. Imam Ali brought them up since their mother Fatima died. And do you know what hurt Imam al-Hassan secondly? When he sees his father say to him, if Abd rahman ibn Muljam is thirsty, then make sure you give him water. And if Abd rahman bin Muljam needs food, give him the best food. And if Abd rahman bin Muljam needs clothing, clothe him. And if Abd rahman bin Muljam's one strike kills me, then strike him with one. Don't mutilate his body. Because Rasulullah said, don't even mutilate the body of a dog with rabies. Can you live after the death of a father like this? Can you live? And you know what made it worse for him? He said, when I went to bury my father, on my way back, I saw a man crying. He said, on the way back, when I saw this man crying, I looked at him, I said, oh man, what's wrong? He looked at me and he said, and according to some narrations, this man couldn't even see. He looked towards me and he said, for three nights, for every night in this holy month, there used to be a man who would come and feed me. But for three nights, I haven't seen any man. I don't know who the man was. I'm crying because I was used to him coming to feed me. And the Imam began to cry. He said, that was my father, Ali ibn Abi Talib. So he looked at me and said, where's he been for these three nights? He said, Ibn Muljam struck him and I just buried him now. <laughs> it's difficult after that. But he had to take the responsibility of Imam at the age of what? At the age of 37, he took the responsibility of Imam. When he stood up in Kufa, he told the people last night, the best of Allah's creation after Rasul Allah has died. A man who was the man of piety, the man of justice, the man of honor. Now I take over the position of succeeding my father. And I'm telling you, I am surprised that a Muslim ummah that says there are only four rightly guided Khulafah. So you are saying Imam al-Hassan is not rightly guided? Imam al-Hassan is not rightly guided? So Imam al-Hassan is now alongside Muawiyah, is that what Islam came to? Sometimes a Muslim needs to sit back and ask themselves, what did we do in our history? Who wrote the books? Imam al-Hassan, when he came into power, Muawiyah had already fought his father. Now Muawiyah was in control of four countries. Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria. In those days, Sham doesn't mean Sham today. Sham today is just Syria. Sham in those days, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, four countries. And Muawiyah began an onslaught against Imam al-Hassan. Muawiyah was sending spy after spy. Find out what's he saying, what's he doing? When Imam al Hassan caught these spies, this is now an important moment. When Imam al Hassan caught these spies, Imam al Hassan said, What is it that he wants? He wants a war? Let's have a war. Does he know whose son I am? I'm not worried about him. Let's have a war. There's one problem. Your father's just had three wars and his soldiers don't want to fight anymore. That's the problem that he faced. And that's the problem many did not understand. Jamal, Safin, and Nahrawan, three wars in four years. Imam al Hassan wanted to finish Muawiyah. But when he turned around in the mosque in Kuba, he said, Oh, soldiers! Get ready, let us go out and fight Muawiyah. Many of them turned around and said, we are tired of fighting. He said, but there is boy, there's injustice, there's oppression. What do you mean you're tired? We all have to stand up. Adi bin Hatam, Adi son of Hatam al tai Adi Sulab, he said, what's wrong with you? Is this not the grandson of Rasulullah telling you to come? And all of them are like, we are tired. Imam managed to mobilize 20,000 of them. You know how many Muawiyah had? 76,000. Even then, 76,000 against 20,000, you think Imam gave up? Imam didn't give up. 
Imam said to his soldiers, let's fight. But you know the second problem he's faced? The first problem, soldiers are tired. Second problem, the soldiers who are turning up, give them a million dinar in an envelope, they're willing now to change their religion. It's hard to find 72, isn't it? 72 is hard. Karbala, 61 AH, 10th of Muharram. How many? How many? 72. It's hard to find more than that. Honestly, in this world, it's hard. If he had more, he would have gone ahead. His own cousin, Abaydullah ibn Abbas, his cousin, had 8,000 soldiers under him. Imam sent them to the front. Muawiyah sent 1 million dirham to Abaydullah. That's it, swap sides. Soldiers, money. Muawiyah, the promises he was giving. Because remember, Muawiyah's government was huge. Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, all under Muawiyah. All of them under Muawiyah. Muawiyah was promising some soldiers, if you want my daughters or my nieces, you can marry them. Others, he was saying millions, palaces, horses, whatever you want, I'll give you. Others, he was offering them positions and posts. Imam al-Hassan ended up with 8,000 soldiers, Muawiyah 76,000. And even then, Imam al-Hassan after that was still saying, let's fight. If you're ready to fight, I'll go. But then Muawiyah did the cleverest thing, spread a rumor amongst Imam Ali's people, that, uh, Imam Hassan's people, that Imam al-Hassan doesn't want to fight. When the rumor was spread, who were there? The Khawarij. Khawarij were like, we hear Hassan doesn't want to fight. Imam al-Hassan wanted to fight. Imam al-Hassan actually had the confidence that if you give me that battlefield, even if they're 10 times more than me, I can finish them. Even if they're 10 times more, I can finish them. I have the bravery. Leave it to me. And I've got Adi bin Hatam. I've got Hajar bin Adi al-Kindi. I've got others. Amr bin Hamak al-Khuzai. These soldiers with me, I can finish. But Muawiyah played the clever game. Spread a rumor that Hassan wants peace. So the Khawarij turned around to him and said, we hear that you want peace. And they came and they stabbed Imam al-Hassan in his thigh. And Imam al-Hassan at this moment, you know this Imam is an oppressed Imam. People do not realize. This Imam didn't want peace. Imam wanted to finish Muawiyah. But now he thought to himself, if I've got soldiers who are going to stab me in the back and Muawiyah wants to stab me in the front, who can I trust? So he did what his grandfather Rasulullah did at Hudaybiyah. Sometimes Imams of Ahlul Bayt, when they base a decision, they base it on what their grandfather did in his life. His soldiers were saying, fight! Muawiyah, even if there's a few of us left, Imam calculated, he thought, no. I swear that if we fight, there will not be a single Shia living on this earth. So they said to him, what are you going to do? He said, we'll do what my grandfather did at Hudaybiyah. We'll sign a treaty, but through the treaty, we'll expose the other side. You know, if Muawiyah and Imam al-Hassan fought and Muawiyah killed Imam al-Hassan, people would have still liked today said, Sayyidina Muawiyah, Sayyidina al-Hassan. There was a bad problem between them. So you know what Imam did? Rasulullah, when he signed the Hudaybiyah Treaty, his companions said, why? Let's kill them. Rasulullah said, no, no, no. If you fight, people will still not know who's right and who's wrong. Let's have a peace treaty. But in the treaty, we make a condition. When the other side breaks it, then the people will know who's on the right and who's on the wrong. Imam al-Hassan, when the people said to him, who are you basing your decision on a peace treaty with Muawiyah on? He said, my grandfather did the same at Hudaybiyah. And do you know what the terms of the treaty? Do you know why Imam al-Hassan signed that treaty? Imam al-Hassan signed it because the terms would expose Muawiyah's behavior. Muawiyah and Yazid are two different people. Yazid publicly, not religious, privately, not religious. Muawiyah, publicly, unbelievably religious. Imam al Hussein has to fight Yazid because Yazid's blatant moral corruption. Imam al Hassan has to be cleverer now with Muawiyah. So, Imam al Hassan, what does he do? He signs a treaty with Muawiyah, but he sets these terms. Term number one you'll stop the cursing of my father in the Friday prayer. Term number two, you will not change the sunnah of my grandfather. Term number three, you will stop the killing of the Shia of my father. 
Term number four, the blood money of Jamal and Safin is to be returned back to the owners. Term number five, when you die, you will give this leadership to me or my brother Hussein. Did Muawiyah honor any of those? None of them. Term number one, you stop the cursing of my father, Ali ibn Abi Talib. 60 years, every Friday prayer. Every single Friday prayer for 60 years begins, may God curse Ali ibn Abi Talib. Every Friday prayer for 60 years. Term number one, broken. Term number two, you will not change the sunnah of my grandfather, the Holy Prophet. And you find Salat al Jum'ah was prayed on a Wednesday. Salat al Jum'ah, when, when is Jum'ah? Friday. So why are we praying on a Wednesday? Muawiyah. Pray Jum'ah on a Wednesday. Muawiyah gives the khutbah. The idea of a khutbah is the joint to be standing when you give a khutbah, isn't it? You find that Muawiyah would sit when he'd give a khutbah. And other changes to the sunnah, and others, and others. Number three, you don't kill the Shia of my father. Killed Hajar bin Adi al Kindi, Amr bin Hamak al Khuzai, Rashad al Hajari. All of these were killed by Muawiyah. Number four, the blood money of those who died at Jamal al Safin, you return it. They didn't return any money. But the fifth was the worst. You return the leadership back to us. Did he return it back, or who did he give it to? He gave it back to his son Yazid ibn Muawiyah. He gave it to Yazid. But what did Imam al Hassan achieve from that peace treaty? Imam al Hassan achieved two things. Number one, I've exposed his character now. Now you see clearly what he's about. Tell me, a man who curses the fourth Khalifa, am I meant to say radiallahu anhu him? I don't understand. What type of mind am I using? So Ali radiallahu anhu and Muawiyah radiallahu anhu? Wallah, that's going to be some Jannah we're going to go to, I tell you. And then on top of that, he made sure that the followers of Al Muhammad's life would be saved. Because had Imam al Hassan not used the wisdom of his grandfather in signing that treaty, there wouldn't be a follower of Al Muhammad today. They would have annihilated them. But Imam al Hassan looked at those around him. He said, The best option is signing a treaty. And that treaty would lead to the events of the 10th of Muharram. Therefore, those who say Hassan ibn Ali was not brave, I tell you, Hassan ibn Ali, if he had it his way, and if he had his brother's companions, he would have finished off that army right in front of him. Then they made a myth about his personal life. What did they say? They said, Imam al Hassan, all he does is get married, divorced, married, divorced, married, divorced. The first to make up this myth was who? was Abu al-Hasan al-Mada'ani. Abu al-Hasan al-Mada'ani was the first to make up this myth when Abu al-Hasan al-Mada'ani said, Imam al-Hasan married and divorced 70 women in his life. How many? 70. It's a one wife is enough for you to keep in your house. 70, you have time for 70 marriages and 70 divorces. The son of Rasulullah has nothing else to do. But then when you study Abu al-Hasan al-Madani, nobody loved Bani Umayyah like Abu al-Hasan. I wouldn't be surprised. Then you had Shablanji in Nur al-Afsar says, Imam al-Hasan married 90 women and divorced all 90 of them. And then you had, arguably the worst was Abu Talib al-Makki. Abu Talib al-Makki has a book called Quwwat al-Qulub. It's still available until today. It's a fourth century book. Abu Talib al Makki says Imam al Hassan married 300 women and divorced 300. Do you have time? As in mathematically, is that possible as a human or no? I, I, honestly, I don't know. If you were to calculate it mathematically, can we marry and divorce 300 times with the idda and revocables and all these things? Can you? Maybe someone can do a bit of research on this. Even mathematically speaking, if we were to look, think about it mathematically, Imam al Hassan, they say he married 300 women between the time of his dad's Khalafa until his death. His dad became Khalifa 36 AH, isn't it? Imam al Hassan died 50 AH. How many years is that? 14. Imam al Hassan was already married to three women Khawl al Fazariya, that was number one. And he was married to Umm Ishaq bin Talha. And he was married to Ju'dah, who would later on. 
kill him. Yes? So how many is he married to at the time of his dad's Khilafah? Three. They say 14 year period, he married 300. Yes? If we say he marries the fourth in that 14 years, that would come to a conclusion that if he marries a fourth but keeps divorcing and marries a fourth and divorces, and you've got an Idda period. Someone says, but Idda's for the woman. Well, if she's your fourth wife, you have to wait for the revocable period because she can still come back to you, isn't it? So say 14 times 4. What's 14 times 4? 56. So where did 300 come from? If we're saying four wives every year, 14 times 4, that comes to about 56. Let's say, so Imam al-Hassan, if he did nothing else in Islam but get married, he married 56 women. Wallah, this is ridiculous, I tell you. And this Abu Talib al-Makki, when you study his life, Abu Talib al-Makki, the one who made this uh, hadith, Abu Talib al-Makki, the hadith specialists say, in the last days of his life, he went so insane that he used to look up to the skies and say, oh people, beware of him because he causes all the trouble in my life. I, do I listen to someone like this? This man's insane. But he... Amongst others used to say, Imam al-Hassan, all he does is marry and divorce, nothing else. Do you know who started this rumor? Imam al-Hassan's cousin. Al-Mansur al-Dawaniqi, Abbas al-Khalifa. Do you know why Al-Mansur began this rumor? Imam al-Hassan, we know that the Sayyids all from Imam al husseins line, Imam Zayn al-Abidin, Imam al baqir Imam al-Sadiq. Imam al-Hassan's grandchildren, all of them were fighting against Bani Abbas. Muhammad Nafs al Zakiya, Abdullah ibn Yahya ibn al Hassan, Hussein bin Ali al Khair. All of these were the grandsons or great grandsons of Imam al Hassan. From Hassan al Muthanna, from, uh, from Abdullah, from Yahya. All of them were fighting Bani Abbas. So, do you know what Bani Abbas decided to do? Let's destroy the character of these people's great grandfather. Let's say the man, all he did was divorce his whole life. Nothing more, nothing less. And you find this myth until today, I swear, recently on a television channel, there was a scholar, a so-called Islamic scholar. They said to him, how great is Imam al-Hassan? He said, he's good, but he can't be compared to Muawiyah. So they said to him, why? He said, because Muawiyah was not foolish enough to divorce like Imam al-Hassan used to always divorce. Myth number one, lack of bravery. Myth number two, his divorces. Rasulullah, by the way, destroyed all of these myths even in his lifetime because there's one hadith of Rasulullah which is the most important hadith which proves Imam al Hassan. What was it? My sons, Hassan and Hussein, are Imams whether they are sitting or standing. That's it. My sons, Hassan and Hussein, are Imams, whether they are sitting or standing. Standing means Hussein Karbala. Sitting means Hus Hassan. Imam, does he mean my son Hassan is an Imam? Does he mean Imam of Salat al Jama'ah? No, everybody can be Imam of Salat al Jama'ah. Does he mean Imam of the government? No, every Tom, Dick, and Harry can be an Imam of a government. Imam means Imam for the soul of the human being. Imam as a source of guidance for the human being. My son Hassan is an Imam. My son Hussein is an Imam. Be they sitting or standing. If Hassan sits, he's your Imam. If Hussein stands, he's your Imam. Whoever fights them fights me. Whoever fights me fights Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever angers them angers me. Whoever angers me angers Allah. Yet with all of these accusations, Imam al Hassan maintained manners to the highest level. I tell you. They used to call him a man of morals, a man who was as noble as Rasulullah. People used to say, What has al Hassan inherited from you? He used to say, My manners and my nobility. Imam al Hassan one day is walking. I tell you, Imam al Hassan, one day his manners, when people were angry with him, a man came to him and said to him, May God curse you and curse your father, Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know what he replied to him? He said, Oh man, you seem like a stranger in Medina. If you do not have a house, come and live in my house. If you do not have food, let me give you food. If you don't have clothes, let me give you clothes. 
Oh man, welcome to our house. Maybe they told you the wrong information about me and my father. And the man looked at him and he said, No, no, no. I have never seen morals like your morals. I abuse your dad and you come back to me soft-heartedly. Truly Allah knows where to place his message. You would find on another occasion, Imam Al-Hassan used to be known as, as the generous one. A man says, I entered Medina, I was hungry. I saw this man walking. I said to him, excuse me, oh man, do you mind if I come and eat some food at your house? I don't have anywhere to eat. The man said, you're more than welcome. But I have a son who lives down there. Why don't you go to him? He said, well, now that I've seen you, I prefer to eat at your house. He said, I entered his house to eat with him. But this man, all he was eating was dry bread. You know who it is. All he was eating was dry, dry bread. And I'm getting this bread. I'm trying to break it without showing him and I can't break it. He said to him, excuse me, oh man, where was your son's house again? He said, oh, it's the one there. He went, he had a brilliant meal at Imam al-Hassan's house. Then Imam al-Hassan looked at him, he said, who sent you here? He said, I don't know, this man, he lives down the road from you. He said, what does his house look like? He said, like this. He said, what does he look like? He explained. He said, what was he eating? He said, he has dry bread. Doesn't eat anymore. He said, so why did he send you here? He said, you will not find anyone as generous as my son. He said, what a father I have. What a father, like Ali ibn Abi Talib. Generosity, the house of Imam al-Hassan. Morals, the place of Imam al-Hassan. Knowledge, Imam Amir al muminin used to say, nobody embodies knowledge like my son, Imam al-Hassan. You want my knowledge, go and ask him any question. And that's why one day a group of Romans came to Muawiyah. And when these Romans came to Muawiyah, they said, you claim to be the Caliph of God? He said, yes, I am Amir al muminin even though in the treaty it said you can't call yourself Amir al he called himself. They said, we have some questions to ask you. He said, what are they? They said, what is the distance between the heavens and the earth? And what's the distance between right and wrong? And what is a new agenda? And which existence came without a mother and father? And which ten things one is harder than the other? Muawiyah looked at them and he said, I have not got a clue what you're talking about. Go to Hassan and ask him. The Romans went to Imam al-Hassan they said, we have some questions. He said, go ahead. He said, what is the distance between the heavens and the earth? Imam al-Hassan said, the cry of an oppressed person in dua. He said, what's the distance between right and wrong? Imam al-Hassan said four fingers between the ears and the eyes. What you see, what you hear in the ears must be verified by the eyes. What's a neutral gender? Imam says a child, if you cannot tell their gender, you will wait for seminal emission. If there is no seminal emission, you'll wait for the urine. Depending on the shape of a urine, you'll know if it's a male or female. If still after that, then they are known as a neutral gender. Said, which animals were born without a mother and father? Or which humans were born without a mother and father as well? Animals and humans. He said, Adam, Eve, the sheep in the story of Ibrahim, the snake in the story of Musa, the crow who buried Adam, who buried Habil and Qabil. He said, these were all born without a mother and father. And the camel of Prophet Saleh, alayhi salam. No mother, no father. They said to him, which ten things one is harder than the other? He said, stone is hard, iron breaks the stone, fire melts the iron, water extinguishes fire. The clouds carry water, the wind blows the clouds, an angel controls the wind. The angel of death overpowers the angel who controls wind. Death overpowers the angel of death and Allah overpowers death because he is the living that does not die. And these Romans all came towards the religion of Islam. In terms of his knowledge, his generosity, his morals, there is none like Al Hassan ibn Ali. None. And that's why he left a legacy behind. 
You know what Karbala? He had more sons than Imam al Hussein to give away at Karbala. And look at those valiant sons he gave away. Wallah, when you look at each of those sons, if I was just to mention two of them, one of them, his son Abdullah, I tell you that Abdullah who he gave away, that Abdullah who he gave away, Sayyidah Zainab says, I saw Hussein lying on the ground with arrows surrounding his body. And Umar bin Sa'ad saying to Harmala bin Kahil, shoot an arrow on his chest. As he was about to shoot, I saw the young son of Imam al Hassan run and shout out, How dare you strike my uncle first? Strike me. And he sat on his um, near his uncle and he put his hand out and he said, My uncle, I'll never allow them to kill you while I'm alive. That son, Abdullah, there is none like him. And is there a son like Al Qasim? Is there or not? That Qasim, I tell you, that Qasim. How did a mother survive seeing the pieces of body spread around the ground in Karbala? And that's why Imam al Hassan, one memorable thing he tells Imam al Hussein before he dies. You know, there is some really stupid narrations about how Imam al Hassan died. One narration, which this historian Donaldson says, Imam al Hassan died from tuberculosis. And another says, a stick fell in his foot. And another says someone stabbed him. No, Imam al Hassan. Muawiyah said to Ja'dah, the wife of Imam al Hassan, he said to her, If you poison Hassan, I'll let you marry Yazid. She poisoned Imam al Hassan. She said, Now let me marry Yazid. He said, You just poisoned the grandson of the man who bought this religion. You think I'm going to allow you to marry? Things were phenomenal. He said, Abba Abdullah, I can hear your sisters coming. Cover the ball. Cover the ball. Because I can't bear to let Zainab see what's in that bowl. I say to him, Imam al Hassan, if you couldn't bear to let Zainab see what was in that bowl, then how did you think about Zainab when she saw your brother's head in a bowl in Sham? You find that Imam al Hassan had this magnanimous nature about him, and therefore it is vital that we honor him like we honor Imam al Hussein. In our communities, we have one night for the shahad of Imam al-Hassan and ten nights for the shahad of Imam al-Hussein. Maybe it's about time we started thinking about ten nights for the both of them. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam, to allow us to be amongst his companions in this world and the hereafter. Allow us to receive his intercession.